to the Power We Hold podcast. I hope you've been enjoying the episode so far with my co-host Caleb Williams and I. I am Vanessa Alberry, the host of the Power We Hold podcast. And today I woke up from a nap and immediately had the inspiration to um, ask you a question. And of course, I'm not able to literally ask you this question in person, but um, it's more a question that I've been asking myself. And I'm curious, have you been asking yourself this as well? What, you know, where does it um, fit into your life? So what I'd like to know is, how has your life changed since the COVID-19 pandemic began in March of 2020? What have you learned and what are you bringing forward with you into the now that we are, you know, reopened for the most part, at least in um, America? You know, people are flying. I see planes in the sky constantly. I took a trip for the first time on a plane at the beginning of November. And, you know, there's no going back to normal, right? That's over. Normal is done. How we knew normal before is is over. We need it to be over. Like, we need it to be over on many fronts, right? And I'm talking, you know, in regards to the environment, in regards to uh, racial justice, in regards to how we interact with each other, in regards to healing journeys, in regards to our spiritual development, um, in regards to our work-life balance. You know, all these things need a reboot. And the pandemic was our first opportunity to really, you know, investigate those changes and instill a new way of living on the planet. And I'm talking on an individual basis and as a species, because, you know, the way we've been driving the ship (laughs) um, as of late up until the pandemic, um, humans are not going to survive ourselves. You know, the planet's going to survive without us. It will recover from all the toxins and pollution and uh, over mining and, you know, major uh, impact that our our human activity has had on the planet. The the planet's going to survive us, right? It's huge. It's massive. We're not going to take it down. But we might take ourselves down, right? And... um. And this is our chance, right? This is our chance to create a new normal. So my question is, how has your life changed since the beginning of the pandemic in March? Uh, My life has changed incredibly for the best. I'm, I feel so fortunate and lucky and let's be clear. (laughs) It has not just been smooth sailing, but I feel more aligned with who I am than I ever have been before in my life. I am making conscious decisions, whereas in the past I uh, was on a bit of an autopilot and didn't even know it. Um, I was responding often out of a a place of trauma. Um, And now (laughs) I have the clarity and the self-awareness and the skill set, the tools to stop those response system, pull myself back from those uh, neuro pathway firings in the subconscious brain and redirect myself to um, how I want to be living. And this is both consciously and subconsciously. So I'm talking about a broad, broad scales here, broad, broad strokes. So, but, you know, to get a little more specific, I'm talking about Um, my healing and spiritual journey, which Caleb and I will go into in our conversations because she's on her own healing and spiritual journey. And I super admire um, the ways that she navigates 
her life. Like she's so brilliant. <laughs> she's so brilliant. Um, and I've been clearing my space. I've been clearing my home of things that I don't need anymore. So yeah, this links up with the way that I've aligned my life uh, with my ego and BIPOC allyship, uh, my ego and BIPOC allyship um, values and ethics. And, you know, that's really what I, what I want to talk about with you right now. So um, in March 2020, I was, you know, delighted to be stuck at home. I had never felt so free to do what I wanted with my time, (laughs) Uh, probably since I was four or five years old, um, playing in the backyard, singing songs, mostly Annie, let's be clear, uh, (laughs) with my dog, (laughs) Um, and just having the time of my life, and being free to just do whatever I wanted to do. Like, that's what the pandemic opened the door for, for me. I no longer had to be anywhere. I no longer had to account to anyone for anything. Um, you know, granted before I did those things because that's what I did for work or, you know, uh, out of obligation or out of habit or routine, but wow. But in March, I just, I started, you know, doing a a daily yoga practice. I used to do day, you know, not daily, but a few times a week. Um, but then I started doing it on my own in my home, uh, which is the next level of yoga practice. If you can, you know, it's really nice to be guided by someone else, but when you learn how to guide yourself, it's just a whole nother level of, um, mastery in that practice. And I would spend time in my backyard. Um, and this is a space, you know, in Brooklyn that is very cherished, very coveted backyards. It's a small, you know, plot of land, but it, in my backyard, it is wild. Like it is ebolent. Uh, it has, um, so many different wildflowers and ivies and trees. Um, there are pollinators and butterflies, bees, and then lightning bugs, um, birds of all kinds. I've seen woodpeckers, blue jays, cardinals, crows, doves, little sparrows. My friend Rachel could tell me the names of all the birds that I, that I've seen, but, um, it is an active backyard. Um, because it's not really kept like the landlord doesn't take care of it. And, and then in March, 2020, I started taking care of it, um, and developing a relationship with it. And it's like a really beautiful experience for me. So I was, you know, spending my days taking care of myself probably for the first time in my life. (laughs) Um, My healing journey really catapulted in 2018 from a rock bottom in love where I was like crying at my kitchen table for four days straight Um, and realizing that, oh, like I don't know what self-love is. That's why this is so devastating. If I really loved myself, like I would be just happy that this thing is over, you know, Um, because it was not healthy, right? Anyway, so March 2020, painting the picture, I was really enjoying myself and who I am. And, And that's when Between the Windows came through as an idea. This podcast came through, um as an idea during this beginning of the pandemic. And I started to clear out what I own. I, I've lived in this apartment since 2009, I believe. And I've accumulated a lot of stuff. I also had two storage units because I used to have a studio outside of my home. Um, and so I had all the stuff from there. And I just really started, you know, consciously clearing out. Um, So not only did I get rid of a bedroom's worth of furniture because I had a second bedroom in my place, as well as that second um, storage unit worth of stuff that was my former studio. uh, I also got rid of like 
a dozen chairs, how I managed to fit like 12 chairs <laughs> into this place. They weren't all in my apartment, but I just, I had too much. And I understand now that I was holding on to all that stuff kind of in the way that a hoarder does. It's like, it's a security thing. It's not because you actually need it. Right. And, um, I, I have family members that might jokingly call me a hoarder. I'm not a hoarder. You can walk through my home. You know, I've had guests like, it's not embarrassing. You know, (laughs) it's not like that. Um, but, but I do identify with, you know, the heart of what they were saying, which is like, I had more than I needed. Um, and it wasn't stuff that I needed like in a realistic kind of way. It was stuff that I had as like a security kind of way. So, um, I, I learned how to really start taking care of myself and then no longer needing that security. Right. Um, so other things I got rid of or like coffee mugs, you know, I'm, I'm a one, I'm one person. I can maybe host like four people comfortably in my kitchen. I don't need a, you know, 20 something coffee mugs, right? Like this is Brooklyn. I don't have like, you know, major cabinetry to store dozens and dozens of coffee mugs. Uh, I also got rid of clothes, clothes that I actually, some of the pieces I'm like, Oh, I miss that thing, (laughs) but I don't miss it because I wore it. I miss it because it had sentimental value or, you know, Um, or I just liked the cut of it, even if it didn't fit anymore. Um, I also had an excess of like travel size shampoo and conditioner bottles. Like I just didn't need these things. So, um, I was very careful and I'm still getting rid of things now. Uh, mostly in my studio, I've cleared out most of my home space is, is pretty clear now. Um, man, I'm still working on my studio. Art is a whole nother frontier. I've got to tell you, like you get really attached to certain things. Like, you know, a show card from a show you really liked back in like 2004. Um, some of those things are important to keep, but like I have more than I need again, but that's, I'm okay. So I'm, that's my next frontier. I'm still working on it. Okay. It's, it's in progress. Um, but yeah, you know, getting rid of everything that I've gotten rid of so far, I've been very careful to make sure that if it's a, if it's a good thing, like a valuable thing or, um, a usable thing, not broken, you know, I donated it. So I managed to get rid of about, I don't know, 30% of what I own in the last, um, year about, and 90% of that I donated or sold not very much of it. Did I sell actually, um, the spare bed I had, I donated it to, um, to a refugee organization that gives furniture to, yeah, refugees in New York city, as well as some chairs (laughs) and a side table and a couple of other, you know, nice pieces of furniture that, you know, I just didn't need anymore. Um, and then anything, Oh, I also donated things to the free store project, which is such a beautiful project that's, um, popped up in New York city during the pandemic where, um, there are different sites in the city, um, where you can take your, your good things, your things that are not broken, not damaged, but, um, that you don't need anymore. And just donate it at this store, this little kiosk. It's like a, you know, kind of shantytown style kiosk with like a plastic tarp over it and shelving. And then someone else will take it because they do need it and you can take whatever you need. There's no, you know, it's not just for people that can't afford things. It's for any, it's for all of us. It's for everyone. And there's, I think three sites in my neighborhood or within biking distance of my house. Um, and I just love that project. I think it, you know, it's really healing to be able to donate something and to be able to find something that you need, um, without, you know, having to make it a a monetary thing. Like we can just help each other out like that, right? Like somebody taking it off my hands is actually helping me out. It's 
helping me clear my space, both visually, you know, no clutter and also energetically. Um, you know, I just don't, it's not healthy to have more than you need because it's a crutch. Um, yeah. So maybe one day I'll have my friend Kylan O'Brien on, who is a uh, master feng, feng shui intuitive, uh, to talk all about that because she is a genius. Um, yeah. So anything that I, that I couldn't donate, uh, then I looked into how can I recycle this? Right. So, uh, some things are easy paper, you know, that's easy to recycle glass, hard plastics, metals, no brainers. Um, other things a little more tricky, like a broken lamp. How do you recycle that? Um, I actually have two broken lamps, um, sitting in my storage area in my hallway <laughs> that, um, they're actually there. One of them is easy to fix. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. The other one is a little trickier to fix. Like you need kind of a very skinny hand or like a very long tool to get this one part. They're fixable is a thing. So I'm not willing to, to really, to really throw it out because they can be salvaged and used. And I just, um, I can't just throw out things that, you know, a simple fix can bring them back into working order. Uh, our throwaway culture and replace it tomorrow with Amazon thing is not working. It, it might work in the short term for like convenience and cheapness, um, you know, affordability. But the reality is that those costs on the back end uh, are way higher than we've been calculating or, or thinking about like the cost in the environment. Um, and there are places in the world where, you know, everyone fixes everything. You, your microwave breaks. You don't just toss it and buy a new one for $50. You actually take it somewhere and somebody repairs them. And, you know, I think that we're moving back into that. I'm at least, I hope we are. Gosh, I hope we are. Um, because that was the way back in the eighties and the seventies, you know, your record player would broke, you'd take it to a place, get it fixed up. Um, we really need that to come back. And I'm hoping with the cost of goods going up right now with inflation that, you know, maybe that, that economy can come back. The economy of repair can come back. I have a friend, Alex Hammond, who has a project called Boa's repair shop. And an aspect of that is like fixing broken things. Um, you know, we really need that mindset to come to return to us. <laughs> uh, and it's going to become a financial imperative because it's going to get more and more expensive to ship things and, um, you know, to buy the parts and the pieces to make the products. And, you know, there's blockage uh, of shipping cargo in the, all the ports right now. It's like, you know, can't we just work with what we have here a little better? I think we can. I know we can. I believe in us. <laughs> I really do. Um, it's just so, it's just so attainable. Uh, so in another way that my life has changed outside of clearing my space um, and the, the space that I live in and my property, I've been aligning my purchases with my ethics. So with the environment and with, um, my support of, yeah, BIPOC people, I believe that, and also my support of local businesses and small businesses, because I think all four of those things go together. Um, you know, your money is how you express what you're for in this life. If you start thinking about your money that way, you start spending it very differently you know, it's no longer like, I'm not for Jeff Bezos and lining his pockets and I'm not for, you know, the cheap things that Amazon sells. Like I'm just not for that. So I'm not going to spend my money at Amazon there. Okay. So there've been a handful of times, maybe three times this year that I've used Amazon because what they had, I couldn't find locally. And I looked first, um, like my rabbit who recently passed away bun bun love her she really liked this certain kind of organic rabbit pellet. And I tried to give her this 
this one that I could buy locally and she just wasn't having it. She just did not like it. Um, so anyway, uh, there are, you know, there, there is room for an Amazon, but not in the way that we've been using it. Like it doesn't need to replace walking outside to the corner store to buy light bulbs when you can have them, you know, delivered that day by somebody who's underpaid and overworked (laughs) and, you know, being exposed to COVID-19, um, you know, for your convenience. Like it's just, it, we need our money to go with our ethics. And so I've been buying, um, bamboo toilet paper owned by, um, a, uh, a black owned company made by a black owned company. Um, and I've been exploring other toilet paper companies that are also BIPOC owned and bamboo based. So my paper towels are bamboo based. I barely use paper towels. I'm mostly using hand towels, but there are a couple of, a couple of times, you know, where you just don't want to, uh, clean that goop up with your, your towel. You just need to throw it away. It's rare, but it happens again. It's like, we don't have to eliminate these things from our lives entirely. I, you know, have aired on that side, you know, in 2020, I didn't use Amazon at all. Um, after February, um, but you know, there is room still for some of these things. Like we still need plastic in our world. That doesn't mean that everything we make in plastic needs to be made in plastic. There was a time in the seventies and the eighties. I remember it. You could go to the grocery store, barely anything you would buy would be in plastic. Now you go to the grocery store, almost everything you buy is in plastic. Like how, you know, how far we have fallen (laughs) into the plastic trap. we got to rein it back in you know, plastic has a value and we have, we have far exceeded it. Um, yeah. So, so my question for you is, you know, where, where have you made changes in your life that you're holding on to now that we're opened again? I'm still holding on to aligning my money with my ethics. That's not going to change. It feels really good. Highly recommend it. Um, And it just, you know, everything I bring into my house, I love it. Like, I love my toilet paper. Um, I love my, you know, free range, hormone free, upstate New York farmer's market eggs. Um, Yeah, I love, you know, I love, I love these items. When I buy new clothes, I'm either buying, well, not new, um, secondhand or um, 100% organic cottons and, um, also remade wools and other materials. I don't, I don't really love this idea of wearing plastic. Like there's this trend in turning plastic bottles into clothes. That's not, you know, that's not fully aligned for me. That's like, it's still plastic. Like it's still too much plastic. And yes, it's a, it's a use for the plastic that we do have, but like, can we just not have any, have any more of this overproduction of plastic? Can we just like turn that knob off? Um, and if we did something like that, then these, these things like clothes, you know, athletic wear lines and, and, you know, Adidas shoes made from plastic, th- those would have a short lifespan of production, right there, the, the raw materials would no longer be available ideally. So I'm a bit of an idealist, like, let's be honest. (laughs) Um, but I am pragmatic. I do, you know, um, apply my ideas and then see how they play out in my life. And, and I hold on to the ones that, that work. And, um, you know, I'm like a 99%, you know, following the ethics kind of thing. Um, cause like I said, sometimes you're in a pinch and you do need an Amazon purchase. Like you just, that just, that can happen. Um, but I'm making, I'm painstakingly aware of 
how I can buy that item somewhere else. So that means sometimes it means planning ahead. Sometimes it means um, being more um, careful about what I'm buying because it's costing more to buy it because it's local. Um, And sometimes, you know, it means I'm buying fewer of whatever it is um, because it costs more. So, um, but those are all, those are all good things. Uh, I'm also now only using bar shampoo, bar conditioner, and bar body wash. Uh, I was already using organic, um, liquid, those things. Um, but the reality is, is that one of the biggest costs to the environment, um, is shipping and shipping liquid, which is primarily water, (laughs) it's, it's very costly. That's like one of the heaviest things you can ship. So shipping a plastic bottle full of liquid shampoo, that's like 90 something percent water. It just, it doesn't make sense. I get water in my house. If I have the soapy parts, (laughs) I can use the soapy parts and use the water coming out of my shower. And I got to tell you, it's great. I love it. You know, every time I take a shower, every time I wash my hair or scrub my body down, I'm just like, this is great. (laughs) You know, I'm living how I want to be living. I'm living and aligned with my ethics. Um, And no matter how busy we are in our lives, you know, this is a gift. This is an opportunity to, you know, change the way that we have been living and align ourselves with our ethics because, you know, with the pandemic, everything slowed down, right? We, we, we started working from home. We started, um, you know, washing our hands the way that we should have been washing our hands all along, by the way. Um, we started going out less and reorganizing our time and, you know, now that we're opening back up, it's like, what, what are those things can you hold on to? And and what more can you, can you apply? Because the less we do autopilot and the more we do conscientious purchases, conscientious actions, and, you know, author how we move through the world, the more likelihood we have of surviving as a species. And then on an individual level, the more likely we are to live the kind of life that we want to be living. Don't you want to live aligned with your ethics? And, and do you not see that every little thing you do puts you in line with one set of ethics or another? So why not put yourself in every little thing aligned with where you want to go? Right. Um, yeah. So that's what I have for you today. Uh, I always think my, <laughs> I always think these messages are going to be shorter than they are, but I'm, I'm not a almost half an hour talking about this. And honestly, I could talk about it for hours. I just think it's really important, but I just wanted to, to drop this idea out there. What have you changed in your life since the pandemic? And what are you holding on to now that we are reopened? Um, where are you spending your time? Who are you spending your time with? Where are, have you found discipline with yourself? A lot of people have a hard time transitioning from uh, work to home life when they work from home, <laughs> right? Where are your boundaries there? You know, don't write your boss back after 6 p.m., 5 p.m. Like make a core choice that that's just not who you are, that you are now on off time. And the more disciplined we are in the little things, the more disciplined we are in our entire lives and the more aligned we can be with, you know, with our ethics. What are your ethics, right? What what is your integrity? What does integrity mean to you? I think these are core questions that the pandemic has gifted us to answer for ourselves. And so that's what I'd like to leave you with today. What have you changed in your life since the pandemic and how are you holding on to that while the world around you reopens and quote unquote goes back to normal? 
P.S. That's impossible. (laughs) Um, But this idea, this semblance of going back to normal, it's almost like a test phase. Like, what are you going to do now? Right. Are you going to try to go back to the way it was? Well, that's not going to (laughs) work. It's just not. I just know it. Um, You know, and there's the planet is telling us that that's just not possible. And, you know, the way we treat each other, the way we treated each other before George Floyd died, you know, for a lot of us, a lot of white people, that was a, a real eye opener of like, oh, you know, all these black people that are dying at the hand of police. Um, this is a real problem. It's not just, oh, that one time, oh, that one other time, you know, and, and then your life goes on and you're not thinking about it because you didn't know that person or you don't many, know many black people or, you know, the black people, you know, you don't think that would ever happen to them, right? It's just like, it's all bullshit. The reality is, is that we have ignored for far too long the systemic racism that we live within. And we have overburdened plastic, we have overburdened police, um, and we have overburdened our bodies. And it's time to rein all that back in um, and find a new balance. And yeah, live in a more holistic way. So please stay tuned for our next episode with the Power We Hold podcast, where I will be speaking with Caleb on these topics. And thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you. If you enjoy our conversations and wish to help us continue to create it, please follow the link in the show notes to our Patreon and become a sustaining member or just send a dollar. Just like every download is appreciated, so too is every dollar. Thank you for joining us on the Power We Hold podcast.